Hey everybody, it's Ben from EFI University. And you know, for more than 25 years, I've been testing and tuning and dynoing every combination of car, engine, and vehicle you could imagine. You know, one question that always comes up though is, which gear should I be using when I dyno my car? Should I be in fourth gear where it's one to one? Should I be in a lower gear? Should I be in a higher gear? Well, in this video, I'm gonna talk to you about what the right answer to that question actually is. If you're using a steady state load bearing dyno, I'm gonna show you what it is, how it works. We're gonna take a look at the math involved and we're gonna make sure that the next time you go to dyno, you have a positive experience doing it the right way. If we're going to do serious engine tuning, we need to use a dynamometer. But maybe not for the reason that everybody thinks so. When I ask people what's a dynamometer for, or why do you use a dyno, the most common answer is, so I can find out how much power my engine makes. As an engine tuner, frankly, that's not really our biggest concern. Think about it like this. If I was just going to tune the engine by sitting in the passenger seat and driving around with somebody else controlling the vehicle, every time they go up a hill, down a hill, they accelerate or decelerate, the place that the engine's operating in my fuel or spark tables is changing, which means I'm constantly chasing it around trying to keep up with what the engine's doing. If I was a surgeon in an operating room and I had to perform a complex surgery on my patient, what I would do is I would say, okay, I need you to lay really still while I, for example, take out your kidneys, but don't move because I don't want to cut the wrong thing. You can imagine how easy that would work out for me was that patient's moving all over the place. Instead of trying to do something completely silly like that, what I would do is I would call another doctor, an anesthesiologist. His job would be to come and subdue my patient so that the patient sits still while I do my work. Well, isn't that sort of the same thing that our dyno does for us? Because of the way the dyno works, it can hold the vehicle steady. That means I can maintain a specific load and RPM site while I perform surgery or while I'm tuning the engine. So you're gonna wanna use a steady state load bearing dyno for this job, not an acceleration only or inertia dyno because obviously that won't hold the patient still. A good dyno has two basic modes, hold mode and ramp mode. We use the hold mode to do all of our tuning and then when we're all done, we'll use the ramp mode to measure the power and torque. So as you can see, the last thing we're actually concerned about is how much power and torque the engine produces at wide open at the very top end. We wanna make sure everywhere else that we might drive the engine has actually been tuned. I mean, come on, if you think about it, what percentage of the total time you drive your car, let's say from the moment you get in in the morning and start the engine and drive to work and on the way home, all the way until you get back to your driveway, how much of that time do you think you actually spend at wide open throttle and at maximum power? Probably not very much. I'd venture to say maybe 5% if I was doing a generous uh, sort of assumption, right? Well, that means 95% of the time that we drive our car, we're not at full power and we're not at high RPM. So wouldn't it make sense to focus on 95% of the area where we're gonna use the car? Yeah, of course it would. So using the hold mode of a steady state dyno, what we can do is use the dynamometer as an anesthesiologist and pick any RPM or any load we want and hold the vehicle steady. And we can make changes to things like the volumetric efficiency table or the base spark table and control how much fuel the engine gets and how much spark advance the engine has to optimize the performance, not just at redline, but for every conceivable operating condition we might use the car under. Now, the thing about dynos is if you really understand how they work, they only do a couple of things. They measure the speed, specifically the speed of the rollers, or if it was an engine dyno, the speed of the engine, and they measure torque. You notice I didn't say they measured horsepower. They don't. They actually only measure torque. Let's make sure you understand the difference. Torque, by definition, is work. So we use labels like pounds per feet, right? It's a force over a distance. If I said I moved 100 pound per foot or 100 foot pounds, I could literally have a box that weighs 100 pounds and I could slide at a distance of one foot and the amount of work that I've done is 100 pounds per foot or 100 foot pounds some people would call it, right? But you see, power's different than work because by definition, power is how much work you could do over a period of time. 
And so horsepower is always calculated, not actually measured. To do that, put it into context, how about if I move my 100 pound box one foot? Each time I move the box one foot, I've exerted the same amount of work. So power would be if I gave you my stopwatch and said I want you to time me for one minute, and during that minute, I'm gonna try and move my 100 pound box a distance of one foot as often as I can. So I'm gonna do that as many times as I can, and when we get all done, I will have the amount of work I did over a period of time. If a big strong guy came behind me and ran the same test, he might be able to do the same type of work more often in the same period of time, in which case he's done more power, but the amount of work that he's done each time is the same. So torque is work, power is work over time. Horsepower is always calculated. In fact, since it's calculated, why don't we talk about the formula that you use to get horsepower? There's those two things that the dyno needs to know, right? We said we need to know RPM and we need to know torque. So since it's measuring both of those, what it's gonna do is take the torque value times the RPM and divide that by a constant that we call 5252. That's an interesting number. Have you ever looked at a dyno sheet? In fact, the more dyno sheets you look at, you might notice a strange circumstance that happens on every single one of them, and that is the torque and power are always equal at 5252. So for example, let's say we had an engine that made 500 foot-pounds of torque, and it made that torque at 5,252 RPM. Well, obviously, using simple math, you can see that the two 5252 values cancel out and torque equals horsepower. So 500 foot-pounds of torque at 5,252 RPM equals 500 horsepower. However, what if we went back and redesigned the engine so that we could raise the RPM limit at where it made maximum torque? So now it still does the same amount of work. I still have a 500 foot-pound of torque engine. However, now it does that 1,000 RPMs higher at 6252. I'm doing the same amount of work 1,000 times more often in the same period. Using the same formula, 500 foot-pounds of torque, 6252, divided by 5252, my engine that used to make 500 horsepower now makes 595 horsepower. So you can see that the relationship of horsepower, torque, and RPM is pretty logical. Now that you know this formula, you can calculate it for any RPM and any amount of torque you want. One of the questions that's constantly coming up with regard to chassis downs is, which gear ratio should I test in? How do the gear ratios actually affect power and torque? Well, there's a couple of rules that you want to remember about gear ratios. Number one, a gear ratio will always multiply your torque, but that costs something, so it's always going to divide your RPM. The gear ratios themselves don't really affect horsepower, but drag and friction do. So to explain that a little bit farther, why don't we use another example? How about you grab your calculator and let's put this formula to work. Let's say we have a car that weighs 3,000 pounds. We have an engine that we've installed in the car after we've tested it on an engine dyno. And on the engine dyno, our engine made 300 foot-pounds of torque at 3,000 RPM. So using our formula, 300 foot-pounds times 3,000 RPM and divided by 5252 means that it's producing 171 horsepower. But here's the rub. If I only have 300 pound-feet of work available, how am I gonna make a 3,000 pound car move? The answer is that's gonna be pretty tough. So we're gonna need more force, more work, or what we would call torque available. Luckily, we can use the gear ratios to do that for us. A transmission supplies us just that thing. Why don't we pick a transmission gear ratio for this example that has something like, oh, three to one. Now the benefit here is I'm gonna put 300 pound feet of torque into the transmission, and it's gonna multiply that torque. So if I was to hook my dyno up to the back of my transmission, after I've multiplied that torque, now I'd have 900 foot-pounds available to try and get the car to go. Still not enough to move my 3,000-pound car, but it's certainly getting better. Oh, wait a minute, there's a price to pay, isn't there? I put 3,000 RPM in, and any time my gear ratios multiply the torque, we have to divide the RPM, which means at the end of my transmission, I'm only getting 1,000 RPM out. No problem, let's just plug these numbers into the calculator. So let's see here, we've got 900 foot-pounds of torque at 1,000 RPM divided by 5252, and the horsepower number is 171. 
it actually didn't change. You see, the gain we got from multiplying the torque is pretty much a wash with the loss we got from dividing the RPM. So why don't we go one step further and see if we can get this vehicle to move. Let's take a look at the rear end differential. In our example, let's say that it has a four to one gear ratio. That means I take my 900 foot pounds of torque, I put it into my gears and it comes out at the tires. Nine times four is 3,600 pound feet of torque. Now I think we'll be able to move this car. Again, we have to pay the price. I put a thousand RPMs in and the diameter of my tire is now only going around in a circle 250 times a minute. So my wheel speed's 250 RPM. I have 3,600 pound feet of torque. So 3,600 times 250, divide that by 5,252, and the magic number that comes out on the dyno at the tires would be 171 horsepower. One of the things that's really important to remember here is that the dyno is measuring a power and torque value at the tires. But when you look at your dyno sheet, it's actually backed out the gear ratios. We know that because when you look at your power and torque curves, the bottom of the chart is engine RPM. So the way that the dyno needs to do that is it has to have a reference to what the engine speed was. We can simply compare the engine speed and the roller speed on the dyno, and effectively what you would get is the total amount of gear ratio in the entire car. So remember the dyno measures the torque on the roller. It then takes that value and divides it by the total gear ratio in the car and plots it on your dyno sheet as if it was engine power. The only problem is we have all this drag and friction that we have to pay for in getting that power from the flywheel through the torque converter, the transmission, the differential, and don't forget that tire to roller interface. Because we may have some tire slip on the roller, and if we don't, if we've strapped the car down really tight, there's a good chance that we have so much force that it actually deforms the shape of the tire. Well, all these things cost us energy, meaning you're always gonna get a somewhat lower number on your roller dyno than you will on your engine dyno, and there's really no way to compensate for it because we don't know how much energy was lost between your flywheel and the roller. Just imagine you could change those numbers pretty easily by changing the fluid in the transmission to a thicker or a thinner fluid. If you do that, less energy is being wasted on the way to the rollers. It doesn't really mean that the engine made more power, it just means that we have more left over by the time it gets to the rollers. The way that you ramp the vehicle, or what we call ramp rate, to measure your power and torque also affects your dyno numbers due to something called inertia. Isaac Newton wrote these rules about inertia where he said that an object at rest tends to, what is it? Stay at rest. In other words, the tires are sitting still, the rollers are sitting still, your transmission, your driveline, all these things are going to consume some of the engine's power just getting them to get up to speed. So obviously the faster I try to ramp the car from a low RPM to a high RPM, the more engine power that will be consumed in doing that. Now, most of the dyno companies know this, and so they can see how fast the roller is being accelerated, and they can do a compensation to add that value back in and try and get closer to the value the engine would be producing. The one thing that none of us knows is the exact amount of inertia that's in your vehicle, whether you have a steel flywheel or an aluminum one, whether you have a heavy or a light drive shaft, and what size tires you use, these are all things that are going to affect the amount of inertia in your vehicle that we can only guess at, we can't actually know for sure. So how much inertia in your vehicle is a function of whether or not you have a heavy flywheel or a light flywheel, big tires, small tires, you know, all the things in your specific customized car that aren't the same as it was when it left the factory affect the total amount of inertia and there's no way for us to actually predict that value. Because of that, it's really hard to use a blanket statement and say, oh, you always lose about 15% of your power through a manual transmission and about 18 to 20% through an automatic transmission because the reality is those are variables that change with everybody's car. The most important takeaway from this is that there's really no such thing as an accurate chassis dyno. We're not measuring the engine power, so we shouldn't worry too much about those dyno sheets that everybody gets and they argue about on the internet. They're not really accurate numbers anyway because we're making a guess about all of the inertial and frictional losses in one particular car. You could take the same car on a different day to the same dyno and end up getting a different number. In fact, just the way that you strap the car to the rollers can produce a different number. Even the tire pressures can. 
What's more important than the accuracy of the numbers you get from a roller-based dyno is whether or not it's repeatable and consistent, because the whole job of mapping or tuning the engine is that we're using this tool, the dyno, to hold the car steady and make changes. Every time we make a change, what we're looking for was, did the power and torque go up or down? Was that a good change or a bad change? At the end of the day, the raw number, who cares what that is, as long as it's bigger when we leave than when we came in. 